the transformer architecture has stood the test of time. Ever since the Attention is All You Need paper was published in 2017, there has been almost no architectural changes to it. Well, up until now, a new architectural improvement was proposed in 2022. And this improvement has quickly been adopted into many language models, such as Palm, GPT-Neo, and GPT-J by Eleuther AI, and Meta's Lama 1 and 2 models. And this new method is called ROPE, which stands for Rotary Positional Embeddings. My name is Bai, I'm a machine learning engineer and a PhD in natural language processing. And in this video, I will explain what are rotary positional embeddings and how do they combine the best of absolute and relative positional embeddings. Let's first review why are positional embeddings needed in the first place. The reason is that transformer models are invariant to order by default. So a sentence like the dog chased a pig will have the same representation as the pig chased the dog, even though they mean diff different things, or any other combination of these words for that matter. Because all of these tokens are basically fed into the transformer as an unordered set, and if you want to preserve the order information, then you need to add in the positional information somehow. The most common way of doing this is absolute positional embeddings. Let's say you have an embedding that represents one word in the sentence. Then to represent the positional information, we have a vector of the same dimension as the word itself. So each one of these vectors represents one specific position in a sentence. For example, position 2, meaning the second word in a sentence. And each possible sentence position will be represented by a different vector. Then we simply add together the word embedding and the positional embedding to produce the input for the transformer layer. And there are two main ways you can generate these positional embeddings. The first method is to simply learn them from data, just like the rest of the parameters of the model. So we would learn one positional vector for position 1, for position 2, and so on up to the max length that you want to represent. And this is a problem because the max length that you can represent is bounded. If you only learned positional vectors up to position, say, 512, then there is no way to represent a sequence of longer than 512 tokens. The second method of deriving positional embeddings is using a sinusoidal function that looks something like this. The details of how this is constructed don't matter too much, but basically we are constructing a unique positional embedding for each possible position in the sequence. And the question of which one is better? Well, empirically, people have found that these two methods of learning them from data and constructing them from sinusoidal functions, they have similar performance when used in real models. Another problem is that every single positional embedding is basically independent of each other. So there is not really any difference between position 1 and 2 versus between 2 and 500. But intuitively, we should probably consider positions 1 and 2 to be more similar to each other than to position 500, which is really far apart. A different approach is relative positional embeddings. Instead of representing a token's absolute position in a sentence, we instead learn a representation for every pair of tokens in a sentence. So for example, some way to represent two tokens being distance of 3 apart. Obviously, the position is different for every pair of tokens, so we cannot simply add a position vector to the word vector. And instead, you have to modify the attention mechanism to add in the relative positional embeddings. There are a number of ways you could do this, so in this video, I'll just focus on one model called T5, which uses relative positional embeddings. The T5 model represents each possible positional offset with a bias, which is basically just a floating point number. For example, B1 represents the relative distance between A and B, as well as between B and C, or C and D and so on. And B3 will represent the distance between A and D. And this matrix of relative position embeddings is added to the query key matrix product in the self-attention layer. The advantage of this method is that any two tokens that are, for example, distance 3 apart will be represented by the same bias, no matter what absolute position they are in the sentence. And this method can extend to arbitrarily long sequences as well. But in practice, there are some engineering challenges with relative embeddings. Here I found a benchmark that compares the T5 bias relative embeddings against other types of positional embeddings. 
And what they found was that the T5 positional embeddings were much slower, especially for longer sequences. And the reason is that relative positional embeddings require you to do an extra step in the self-attention layer to add the positional matrix to the query key self-attention matrix. And also for each extra token you generate, the embedding for each token changes. So this makes it difficult to effectively use the key value cache. If you're not sure what is the key value cache, check out my video here that explains how it works and why we need it. But because of the practical engineering challenges here, relative embeddings are not very commonly used today, especially in larger language models. By the way, if you made it this far, please smash the like button to feed the YouTube algorithm and subscribe to my channel to get notified when I post new machine learning content. Now let's talk about rotary positional embeddings. The key idea is, instead of adding a positional vector to encode the position of the word in a sentence, they propose to apply a rotation to the vector instead. So for example, imagine you have a two-dimensional word vector that represents the word dog. Then to represent the word dog appearing in the second position in a sentence, we rotate the vector. Let's call the amount that we rotated by the angle theta. If the word appears in an, an even later position in the sentence, then we rotate the vector even more. And the amount that we rotate is just an integer multiple of the position of the word in the sentence. So to represent the position m in a sentence, we rotate the original word vector by an angle of m times theta. This has a lot of the advantages of absolute positional embeddings. Like if we add more tokens to the end of a sentence, then the vectors for the beginning of the sentence stay the same, which makes them easier to cache. Because as long as the word is in position number one in a sentence, then it does not matter how many more words come after it, because the word's positional embedding will not be affected. An additional advantage is that relative positions of words are preserved. In this sentence, we have the word pig represented by a yellow vector and the dog represented by a blue vector. Now, let's say we add some more random words to the sentence, but preserve the distance between the two words, so the two words are still three tokens apart. Now, because of the way that rotary embeddings are designed, the two vectors are rotated by the exact same amount. Therefore, the angle between the vectors will be preserved. This means the dot product between the two vectors will remain the same when we add words to the beginning or end of the sentence, as long as the distance between the two words stay the same. So we can clearly see that rotary positional embeddings have both the advantages of absolute as well as relative positional embeddings. Let's see how this is implemented. This is the equation from the paper that represents rotary embeddings for the 2D case. The most important part is this part here, which is just a rotation matrix. And what it does is it rotates a vector by an angle of m theta, where m is the absolute position of the token in the sentence. x is a vector that we're trying to rotate, and in this case it is two-dimensional. Also, notice that we apply the linear transformations to get the query and key vectors before we apply the rotation matrix. This is so that the rotational invariance um, property that we talked about earlier is preserved. And we also only need to apply the rotation to the query and key vectors and not the value vector in self-attention. This is an equation for the more general case when the vector has more than two dimensions. And basically it takes your vector and splits it up into chunks of two dimensions and rotates them two at a time. So the first part of the rotation applies a rotation to the first two dimensions of the vector. And then these two terms apply a rotation to the second part of the vector and so on. And we apply a different rotation angle to each pair of dimensions in the vector. They assume that the dimension of the vector is an even number, which is usually the case. And visually, you can kind of imagine this as a n-dimensional corkscrew that's rotating in space. The paper expressed the rotation as a matrix multiplication because this is convenient mathematically. In practice, though, you will never want to do something like this because it is just too slow to construct a matrix and do a matrix multiplication for this. Because the same computation can be expressed in a much simpler way using just two vector multiplications and one vector addition. 
and in fact, implementing this in PyTorch takes only around 10 lines of code. Another useful mathematical property is that when the words are close together, then they are more likely to have a larger dot product. But when you have two words that are separated by a lot of tokens apart, then they are expected to have a smaller dot product on average. This is due to the way that the rotation is defined, and intuitively it makes sense because words that are far apart are less likely to have anything to do with each other. Check out the paper if you want to see a detailed derivation of the math of why all of this works out, but I'm not going to go into it in this video. Finally, let's look at some experiments. And they basically trained the boot and performer models on language modeling tasks, and they found that using rotary positional embeddings, the model trained faster than using sinusoidal embeddings. And other researchers have so far replicated these findings and found it relatively robust across different types of model architectures and training setups. And that's it for rotary positional embeddings. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to leave a comment below. And if you found this video helpful, please like and subscribe to my channel. That's it for now, see you next time.